Good morning, church. God is good all the time, and I pray you recognize that this week. Thanks again to all of you frontline workers. Your service is appreciated. Stay well, and may God's peace comfort you. I am glad all of you joined this broadcast today. God moved in the lives of those participating, and they are excited to lead worship. Tiana, Mason, and John are leading song service. Lamb's Praise is presented by Olivia. We will have a Memorial Day tribute. Natalia and Noah are reading scripture. And Pastor Peter is presenting part two of the Unstoppable Church sermon series. He's entitled today's message, The Witness of the Spirit. I'm looking forward to everything. Now then, before we move on in the program, I want to thank each of you for remembering the church in your tithing and offering. It shows. I know many of you are experiencing a loss of income due to COVID-19. Even so, the Finance Committee reported to the board that as of March 31, we received a little more than we have spent for the year. And that is tremendous. Keep it up. And thank you for the sacrifice and for entrusting the church. Also, in case you didn't hear, the conference set up a COVID-19 relief fund. The deadline to apply is May 25. So read the details as soon as possible at the conference website. It's a fund you can donate towards or apply to to receive funds if you qualify. Finally, donations to Temple City Church are best received online through our website's giving link, or you can also donate through the postal mail right to our mailing address, 9664 Broadway, 91780. Now, let's move on to the rest of our worship service. But before doing so, let me pray with you as we continue. Father in heaven, bless every participant and every receiver of this broadcast as we listen, as we meditate, as we focus, as we watch. May your Holy Spirit enter our lives. We give you permission for it to stay with us. May he dwell with us. May he lead us. May he inspire us through the actions and the words of these worship leaders. Bless Pastor Peter's sermon and continue to comfort each of us with every word spoken today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.
Little Agnieszka grew up in beautiful countryside in southern Poland. A big green forest stood on one side of her house. A green meadow with pretty white daisies and pink and purple wildflowers stretched out on the other side of the house. 
Agnieszka loved nature, but she was easily frightened. She didn't like the dark. Strangers were scary. Her family had cats, dogs, and chickens, but she was scared of them. She was especially terrified of mooing cows and gobbly gobbling turkeys. Fortunately, no cows or turkeys lived at her house. But a flock of turkeys did live in the yard of a farmhouse that she passed on the way to school. Agnieszka loved school and she loved walking to school. One morning, she skipped along the road to the village and turned the corner to school. A few steps later, she saw something that filled her with horror. She stopped in her tracks. Dozens of gobbly gobbling turkeys were wandering on the road. The birds were enormous and they made a loud, scary racket. <laughs> Agnieszka looked to one side of the road, a rushing stream. She couldn't walk through it. She looked to the other side. More gobbly gobbling turkeys were walking in a ditch and strolling in the adjacent meadow. She couldn't walk there. She looked beyond the meadow. The gate to the farmhouse fence was open and the yard was empty. The turkeys had escaped from there. Agnieszka was trapped. She couldn't go to school because of the gobbly gobbling turkeys. She couldn't go home because then she would be late for school. She sat down on the road to hide from the turkeys. God, help me, she prayed. Opening her eyes, she saw an elderly man riding a bicycle toward her. The man wore dark gray clothes and a dark gray cap. His bicycle was dark gray. He was coming from the direction of the school. Fearlessly entering the flock of gobbly gobbling turkeys, he energetically waved his arms and shouted, shoo, shoo. The turkeys gobbled even more and made a frantic dash toward their yard. Feathers flew and the screech of the gobbly gobbling turkeys was deafening. <laughs> Agnieszka was surprised that the stranger wasn't scared of the turkeys. She had never seen him before, but she wasn't afraid. He looked sort of familiar. As the old man rode past her, he said kindly, it's all right now. Agnieszka's mouth dropped open in amazement. She looked at the turkeys gobbly gobbling back in their yard. She looked back at the road to wave at the old man. He had disappeared. Agnieszka happily ran to school. She wasn't even late. The turkeys never invaded the road again. Agnieszka has always remembered God's answer to her frightened prayer. Now the mother of two children, she tells them how the stranger scared away the turkeys. I don't know whether he was an ordinary man or an angel, she says, but I know the victory came from God. I was able to survive the turkeys with God's help. Every year, we pay tribute to those who lost their lives in service to our country for freedom and truth. Many of you are thinking of your own family members, as am I, who have served in the military. We thank each and every one, the families of those who lost family members in service or who were injured, and who went off to war or served in all capacities, putting their lives on the line. We thank you, far and near. Thank you for your service. Let us continue to pay tribute to those who served in the military, and especially those who died in this service, as we watch this Memorial Day tribute video. God bless you.
It's time now to pray together. I'll lead this section with an opening prayer, and then as the music video continues, you're welcome to pray over your prayer requests with your family or on your own. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this moment to congregate together virtually. This is a church without walls. We transcend time and space because your Holy Spirit is promised to be among us wherever we gather in your name. Even if we're not in the same room, the same building, the same state, we are gathering together right now and praying you are in our midst and we thank you for this. We thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for grace, for forgiving our sins, for healing us, for working miracles. The list goes on and on. And we thank you. You are worthy to be praised. We trust that you will continue to work through this church, to work through our church leaders, to work through our government, to have your way with this world. Please continue to work miracles. And as we pour over our prayer request lists, we think about those we love, those we're ministering to. Bless this prayer time. Bless our requests. We humbly ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's scriptures is found, found in Acts, Acts 2, 2, 4, 4 and, and Acts, Acts 2, 2, 38. 38. Acts 
2, 4. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Acts 2, 38. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Happy Sabbath, Church. I hope you're all doing well and being safe. Happy Sabbath, Church. Well, good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath to you. So thankful and privileged to be able to gather together once more in God's presence online virtually. I want to talk for a few moments about the subject I've entitled, The Witness of the Spirit. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, we thank you for your love and mercy that's brought us together and made us alive in Jesus Christ. Bless us and speak through this word today, I pray in your name. Amen. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 16, that the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus, if indeed we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together. In other words, Paul says the Holy Spirit testifies that a radical transformation took place in our lives. First, we have a change of status before God when we accepted Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But if God calls us his children, but we don't feel and act godlike, then we will be most miserable and feel like misfits in the kingdom of God. So then the Spirit of God creates within us a change of experience on the inside of our hearts that proves and verifies for us that we are God's children. Right now, society seeks for a way to identify all those infected by this coronavirus and they are still looking for a cure or a vaccine or a, an antidote. And then various world governments want to find who to blame and judge for releasing this plague on humanity. Now, I have not been tested for COVID-19. Most likely you haven't either. I have no symptoms and to my knowledge, I have not been associated with anyone who has the coronavirus or shows any symptoms. That means I have not had a high fever or any cough or difficulty breathing or sore throat or muscle pains or chills, but that doesn't mean I don't have the virus. Neither does the absence of symptoms mean any of you don't have the virus. In a very real sense, all of us have been exposed to the virus we may have been exposed to the virus, I should say, and yet we don't even know it. We may not know it at all. And we need a way to be convicted, one way or another, of infection or of freedom from infection. But I've been told we don't have enough test kits available for everybody to get tested. And to be clear, we have need for two distinct kinds of testing. The first test determines whether or not the virus actively lives and replicates within your body, causing disease. The second test determines whether or not you've been exposed to the virus and have developed some antibodies that enabled you to overcome the disease and be immune and safe from the horrendous, lonely, brutal death it causes. The medical profession believes that true overcomers of the virus can live free and safe from the disease that yet may rage all around them on the outside and also be free from the impact of any manifestation of the virus living or lurking on the inside of them. In other words, no matter where the virus lurks and lingers, they've got some viral immunity cells living on the inside that are more powerful than the virus cells. In fact, these cells are so effective and potent, they literally knock out the virus. 
And they tell me that if this virus operates like most other viruses, then by a remote possibility, the antibodies of one person who has been exposed to COVID-19 and overcome the virus could be transferred into another human being via a blood transfusion and make that person immune from the virus, whether they have been exposed or not. But I know another virus called sin that's far more deadly than COVID-19. And in a very real sense, all of us have been exposed and infected with this virus called sin. And we are hopeless and dead unless we can find somebody who has overcome the virus of sin and can give us a blood transfusion. And just like the coronavirus, for centuries, the world sought for an accurate test to find those infected with the virus called sin. Humanity searched for a cure or a vaccine or an antidote to sin, and everybody wanted to find the one culprit to blame and judge for releasing this plague of sin on humanity. Just look at what this sin virus has done. It has ravished and destroyed communities. It has decimated families, disrupted relationships, corrupted intimacy, violated our innocence, distorted every aspect of God's creation, ruined lives, polluted our environment, inflamed our bodies, deteriorated our joints, infected nations, and reduced populations. And furthermore, this virus carries a very high contagious rate. Yeah, you don't have to wait for somebody to cough on you or to sneeze on you to get exposed. King David said it. You get exposed by being born in sin and shapen in iniquity. Psalm 51 verse 5 declares, David writes, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Therefore, I know I got the virus of sin, and you got it too. We were born infected with the virus, and all of us have the disease. Henceforth, Paul confirms in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And this sin virus always leads to death, for it represents rebellion against God, who himself alone is love and life. From the very beginning, therefore, after Adam and Eve sinned, God killed a lamb. The sin virus always leads to death. Adam passed that sin nature down to his son, who brought the wrong sacrifice to the altar. I can hear Cain in Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 saying, I've got some fresh, ripe, delicious, colorful, juicy fruit for a sin offering and a sacrifice to God. But God did not accept that offering. And God said, Brother Cain, you got to do right, Brother Cain. The scriptures records God's conversation with Cain in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. God says, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire and thou shalt rule over him. I can almost hear Cain's response. Okay, God, so you didn't accept my sacrifice of fruits and vegetables, so maybe you'll accept the blood of my brother Abel. And the Bible says Cain rose up and killed his brother. The sin virus always leads to death. In Genesis chapter 5, we read about this ongoing, unending litany of death. When you get a chance, just read Genesis 5 for a moment and you will see that everybody is dying. You'll read, and I summarize, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. And all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. And all the days of Enos were 905 years and he died. And all the days of Kenan were 900 and 10 years and he died and all the days of Mahalalel were 890 and 5 years and he died and all the days of Jared were 960 and 2 years and he died and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Hallelujah somebody. Yes indeed the sin virus always leads to death 
But I'm so glad today that God interrupts humanity's death plague with life. You see, Enoch in verse 24 interrupts this ongoing, unending cycle and litany of death. What a radical transformation and shift from the old pattern and legacy of death into everlasting life. This passage teaches us that once again, man can walk with God, and walking with God makes the new life we have in Christ Jesus effective, powerful, and impacting. And the same spirit that enables you to walk with God empowers your immunity from the treacherous power of the virus called sin. In Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, we read, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Hallelujah, somebody. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. God has always longed to walk with his children again and grant them this immunity, this freedom from the power of sin and death. We read in Genesis chapter 3 verse 8 that Adam and Eve heard God's voice as he walked in the garden in the cool of the day. Sadly, they hid themselves from a searching God in a cruel world. From the very beginning, God has always wanted to walk with his children and give this new life. Jesus says to the members of the church in Sardis, read Revelation chapter 3 verse 4. He says, you have a few names even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. Revelation chapter 3 verse 4 declares this amazing, wonderful truth, indicating that even Jesus at the end of time is declaring, you've got some names among you. Even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And then at the end of the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 21, verses 23 to 24, we read, The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. So this becomes the context into which the gospel of Jesus Christ comes. Jesus comes to a world where the virus of sin reigned and ruled in every heart. Beginning with Adam and Eve, all struggled with this infection. Humanity banished from their garden home, quarantined on planet Earth, socially distanced from the heavenly realm, and compelled to wear the proverbial masks of pretense and lies. A society forever on the edge and on the lookout for outbreaks of sin here and rebounding crime resurgence there, unending war and no peace, a humanity economically impacted and impoverished by the sin virus, men and women disempowered and disinherited and disinterested in godliness, everybody afraid and sheltered in place. God comes into this sick, sinful human condition and walked with the human family once again. God in Christ comes exposing himself to the virus of sin, but Christ overcame sin and did no sin. Therefore, God is not quarantined. He's not shielded in his divine PPE. He's not separated. He's not keeping his distance. He's not scared and protected in some safe house harbor somewhere. He's not hanging out in no underground bunker away from the bombs and missiles of war awaiting peace talks to take place and treaties to be signed. He's not shielded in some bulletproof bubble and barricaded behind the Milky Way galaxy away from the piercing darts of sin and evil. He's not wrapped up and cloaked in a white poison proof suit, his eyes sealed by protective goggles and breathing through a gas mask so that he's unexposed to the virus of sin. He's not secreted or secreted and secluded and sequestered from the horrible horror and hobbled hogtied ugliness of human deformity. 
He's not sick to his stomach from the putrefying stench and the miasmic misery of man's cesspool of sickness. He's not plugging his ears from evil's noise. He's not filtering his nostrils, nostrils from evil smells. He's not shading his eyes from evil's sight. Yet he is not immune from our sickness, pain, and suffering. For in Christ he chose to die from the sickness of human sin. Because of his great love for us. And yet Christ Jesus did no sin. And therefore instead he became the one who overcame sin's power. And on the cross he offers the antidote. His precious blood. The prophet Isaiah said it surely. He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. So the blood of Jesus changes our standing before God so that in God's eyes, we are covered in the blood. We stand fully justified and whole and healed from the sin virus. But how does God change our personal subjective life so that we ourselves experience that power, that wholeness, and that healing from sin? Ah, uh, he promises the Holy Spirit to each believer. You see, Jesus is the overcomer. He overcame sin, and so his blood was overcomer's blood. And he's able to give us the transfusion of that blood. Jesus shed his precious blood on the cross to satisfy the debt and penalty of sin. And his blood transfusion has power to give every human being viral immunity from the virus of sin. Oh, but we need a helper operating within our hearts to apply that blood and empower us to live like this blood sacrifice is effective. The Holy Spirit operates within our hearts, convincing us that the sacrifice of blood is effective and accepted. That helper, the Holy Spirit, continues to work within us to free us from sin's power. Look at what John records. Jesus saying in John chapter 16, verses 7 to 11, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Just look at the tasks assigned to the Holy Spirit. He will convict the world of sin. That's the virus. Of righteousness, that's the cure, the vaccine, the antidote, and of judgment on Satan, the culprit, who let this plague of sin loose on the world. Of sin, because not believing in Jesus is the primary basic sin plaguing us. Of righteousness, because Jesus is with the Father now and he alone is righteous. We have no righteousness on our own. Of judgment, because Satan, our enemy, stands trial and has been convicted of letting this plague of sin loose on the world. But how does the Holy Spirit show up in our lives? The same way the Holy Spirit showed up in the early church. Luke records Jesus saying in Acts chapter 1 verse 4, Wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. You see, brothers and sisters, we cannot do anything without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says, But ye shall receive power 
after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And finally in Acts chapter two, verses two to four, it happened. The scripture says, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of a fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Acts chapter 2 verse 38 makes it clear for us that this same power of the Holy Spirit comes on all of us who repent and are baptized. Look at the text. Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The power of the Holy Spirit comes into the life of the believers who have repented and are baptized. And this mighty power operates within you to fight against the virus of sin and empower us to live for God and heal us from our addictions and our brokenness and restore us as children of God in the kingdom of God. Through the Holy Spirit at work in your life, God produces an incredible change in every human heart. The Christian life is not a modification or an improvement of the old, but a total transformation of the human nature. There is a death to self and sin, and a new life altogether emerges. This change can be brought about only by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit. The scriptures testify that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, we read, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Oh, I got to quit now, but I remember in John Macefield's trial of Jesus, a woman named Procula asks the centurion who carried out the crucifixion, where is Jesus now? To which the centurion said, he's let loose in the world, lady, where no one can stop his truth. And I just stopped by to tell you today that through the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ is let loose in the world. He's let loose in every human heart today. When you surrender to the death of the cross, your old nature dies. When you surrender to the burial of his tomb, your sins are buried. When you surrender to the resurrection of Sunday morning, the new life surges within you. That's the life of the Spirit. And when you say, Lord Jesus, through the indwelling power of your Holy Spirit, take control of my life today, his power gets released in you and no one can stop it. That's right, my friends, nobody can stop him. You can't stop his power. You can't stop his love. You can't stop his mercy or his grace or his forgiveness or his goodness or his kindness. He is loose in the world and in every human heart and no one can stop his truth. You see, in every sense of the world, the word, in every sense of the word, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from every sin so that when we, so that we can be virus free. So that now the test the Holy Spirit administers for us determines daily if we are still virus free. You see, if you don't believe on Jesus, you have the sin virus. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin because they don't believe on him. That's the viral test we must all take daily. And of righteousness, because we have no righteousness of our own. Christ Jesus himself is the only righteousness and the radical transformative new life he offers gives us the cure, the vaccine, the antidote, and the mighty power to live every day a new life daily we live 
with this power and we live as overcomers from the sin virus. And then Jesus says, and of judgment, because Satan, the prince of this world, who released this deadly plague on humanity, has been placed on trial, he's been judged and found guilty. Once we get that truth, beloved, we can stop pointing fingers at one another and start loving each other. For the same power of the Holy Spirit that lives in you and operates within your life lives and works in your brothers and your sisters who have accepted Jesus Christ too. I invite you to live today and always like this is true. Live like Christ Jesus is indeed loose in the world and in your life and no one can stop him. Through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, no one can stop his truth in your life. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that comes into our lives once we accept Jesus through repentance and baptism. I thank you, O oh God, that we have the power to live an overcomer's life because through the mighty blood transfusion of Jesus where we've been washed in his blood and cleansed, we have access to a new life in Christ Jesus. Why? Because you have deposited your Holy Spirit, which you promised to us, you've deposited that Holy Spirit as a gift in every one of us. We thank you, O oh God, for this incredible and amazing truth. I pray today that it will transform us right now, right here. Go to work, oh God, through your spirit, taking up leadership and rulership in our hearts today and bring about that radical transformation you promised that we will have the same power as the early church had once they were filled with the spirit. They were able to turn the whole world upside down. Likewise, I pray, oh God, that we can have that resurgence of the Spirit's power, so we can also turn the world upside down, even now while we are sheltered in place and worshiping together virtually. I pray, O oh God, that you'll be with each one. Bless each member of our congregation. Bless our extended congregation worldwide, worshiping and watching and participating in this broadcast. And O oh God, I pray that when you come that great day, none would be lost but we'll all be saved in you and through you because of the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray in the name of Jesus and for his sake, amen.